Chapter 5 by Special Invitation The following Saturday, Marie Grace was bursting with news. She was so excited that she bolted down her breakfast and raced through her chores. Then she and Argos hurried to the music hall. They arrived well before the usual time. While Argos stayed with Louis, Marie Grace bounded up the stairs to the second floor. Through the closed door of Mademoiselle's studio, she could hear Cecile practicing the same line of music over and over. As soon as she was sure that Cecile's lesson was done, Marie Grace opened the door. Mademoiselle, Cecile, she greeted them. The most wonderful thing has happened. Marie Grace pulled a heavy square of parchment paper out of her cloak and showed it to them. Last night, a messenger brought this. It's an invitation to the children's opera ball, and it's addressed to me. I'm so glad it arrived, said Mademoiselle, her face wreathed in smiles. Marie Grace stared at her in surprise. You knew about it? Mademoiselle nodded, her eyes twinkling. Yes, my friend Gabrielle was helping with the list of invitations, and I asked her to send you one. The opera ball is one of the best children's balls of the season, so you should have a wonderful time. I think I have a costume that will be perfect for you, too. For a moment, Marie Grace was speechless. She was thrilled to be invited to the costume ball, and now she knew that Mademoiselle Ocean had arranged the invitation just for her. Marie Grace felt a lump in her throat. Papa loved her, and he was kind. But this was the first time since Mama had died that anyone had made her feel so cherished. Thank you, she said finally, holding the invitation close to her heart. Thank you so much. You are welcome, Cherie, Mademoiselle replied. I thought you might like a special treat. Marie Grace felt a happy glow until she looked at Cecile. Her friend was frowning fiercely and sorting her sheet music so roughly that the music stand shook. Cecile, Mademoiselle Ocean asked, whatever is the matter? Cecile settled the sheet music on the stand with a thump. What about me, Mademoiselle? Don't I get a special treat, too, she burst out? I've been your student longer. Marie Grace did not understand. Cecile was always so confident and bubbling with happiness. She had a loving family, a maid to watch over her, lots of friends, and even a parrot that talked. Surely she can't be envious of me, Marie Grace thought. Cecile, calm yourself, said Mademoiselle Ocean. Then she added gently, you and I have shared many special times, too. And you go to a lovely Mardi Gras ball every year, no? We, Cecile admitted. She studied the floor for a moment before she looked up at her teacher. I'm sorry, Mademoiselle. Cecile turned to Marie Grace. I was very rude just now, she said, blinking back tears. Please forgive me. Yes, of course, said Marie Grace instantly. Your news is wonderful, Cecile continued. Mardi Gras is too, truly magical. You'll see. Marie Grace's excitement began to return. She glanced at the fancy invitation in her hands. So are you coming to the children's opera ball too, Cecile? She asked hopefully. Why, no, Cecile said, sounding surprised. Then, seeing the puzzlement on her friend's face, she explained, I am going to a ball. But we free people of color have our own separate Mardi Gras parties and balls. Marie Grace looked from Cecile to Mademoiselle and back again. Why? Here in New Orleans, white people and people of color lived on the same streets and shopped at the same markets. Couldn't they go to the same Mardi Gras balls? Because, Cecile shrugged, it's always been that way. Marie Grace frowned. It would be such fun if she and Cecile could enjoy Mardi Gras together. I wish we could go to the same ball, she said, half to herself. Girls called Mademoiselle Ocean, lightly tapping her baton on the piano to get their attention. This year, both balls will be held at the same place on the same, e same evening, she smiled. Perhaps you will see each other. Now, Cecile, shall we help Marie Grace choose her costume? Mademoiselle gestured toward the far end of the room, where a pair of trunks sat half hidden by a Chinese screen painted with dragons. Why don't you look in that first trunk, she suggested. It has the fairy costumes that the children wore in the magic flute. I'm sure one will fit you, Marie Grace. You may try them on behind the screen. Marie Grace searched through the cedar-scented costume trunk until she found several sparkling gowns with masks and delicate matching fairy wings. Cecile helped Marie Grace gather up an armful to try on. Marie Grace took the fairy costumes behind the screen. She soon discovered, however, that trying on costumes was harder than she had expected. There were laces to be tied and confusing buttons to be buttoned. She was glad Cecile was there to help. 
Finally, Marie Grace found a costume that fit just right. She stepped out from behind the screen. Cecile clapped her hand. It's magnifique. It is magnificent. You look beautiful, Marie Grace, added Mademoiselle. I wish your papa were here to see you. Marie Grace hurried over to the tall mirror that stood in the corner. When she saw her reflection, she breathed a sigh of happiness. The silver shone in the light, and when she spun around, the delicate fairy wings fluttered on her back. As Marie Grace looked into the mirror, she remembered the fairy tales her mother used to read to her. For a moment, she could almost imagine her mother standing behind her, smiling. Thank you, mademoiselle. And you too, Cecile, she said, turning to face them. I never dreamed of such a beautiful costume. But you must get dressed now, Marie Grace, mademoiselle reminded her. It's past time for us to start your lesson. Go on, Cecile said. I'll put the costumes away. She gestured to the shimmering wings and gowns. Marie Grace thanked her and quickly changed back into her own clothes. She was already working on her second song by the time Cecile finally came out from behind the Chinese screen. Cecile waved a cheerful goodbye as she hurried out the door. I can hardly wait for Mardi Gras, Marie Grace thought as she hit her highest note. On the evening of the children's opera ball, Marie Grace waited by the window in her father's office. Papa had promised to be home by six o'clock so that he could take her to the ball. Now it was past six thirty, and there was still no sign of him. Marie Grace peered out the window, looking in every direction. Then she paced up and down the length of the office, her crisp petticoats crackling. Do you see him yet? Marie Grace asked Mrs. Curtis. Not yet, said Mrs. Curtis with a sigh. And that's the fifth time you've asked me. Now settle down, dearie. You look very nice, and your father will be home soon, I'm sure. Marie Grace continued to pace as the minute hand of the big clock inched forward. At ten minutes to seven, she asked Mrs. Curtis if she could walk to the ball by herself. Argos can come with me, Marie Grace pleaded. We walk to the music hall every Saturday. No, Mrs. Curtis said firmly. It's not proper for a girl your age to be out by herself at night. If my arthritis weren't so bad, I would walk you over there by myself. But as it is... Suddenly the doorknob rattled, and Marie Grace breathed a sigh of relief. But when the door opened, it wasn't Papa. It was only a boy. He handed Mrs. Curtis a folded note. Message for you, ma'am. Mrs. Curtis, who had never learned to read, pushed the note to Marie Grace. Marie Grace read ab aloud the short scrawled message from her father. Can't leave patient. But Papa promised, Marie Grace thought in despair. She turned away so that Mrs. Curtis would not see the tears welling in her eyes. Then she heard Mrs. Curtis's firm voice. Bring us a cab, boy, she ordered the messenger, and be quick about it. Marie Grace spun around, amazed. Well, I can't have you miss the ball altogether, can I now, the housekeeper said gruffly. I may be old, but I still remember how exciting it is for a girl to go to her first dance. Mrs. Curtis took off her apron and put on her bonnet and cloak. Marie Grace quickly gathered up her invitation and her mask. A few moments later, a carriage pulled up in front of the office. As they bounced along the stone-paved streets, Marie Grace could hear fireworks and music echoing through the French Quarter. Oh, I hope I'm not too late, Marie Grace thought anxiously. Go along and enjoy yourself, dearie, said Mrs. Curtis, when the carriage lurched to a stop in front of the Grand Theatre. I'm sure your father will be back in time to fetch you. And if he's not, I'll come myself. Thank you, said Marie Grace as she jumped out of the carriage. Thank you very much. The early evening was getting dark, and men were lighting the street lamps. Marie Grace held tightly to her invitation as she rushed up the wide marble steps of the theater. Her first ball was about to begin.